Like many others who were born in England, I was saddened at the death of the Queen. Somebody asked me the other day, why does it say ER on the insignia? Well, it's Latin. It says Elizabeth Regina, which means Queen Elizabeth. And why does it say CR on the new one? Well, Charles Rex, King of England. So, it makes you wonder how much it's going to cost to change every single one of those insignias from <laughs> ER to CR. C-Rex. <laughs> and then, there's the church. Who thinks, oh, peace trivia, has the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, which is the current book in England, ever been changed? The answer is yes, it has. It was changed quite a long time ago to allow for the changing of the holy water that sits in front of the altar uh, throughout the entire season of Easter. It used to get a little funky after being there for 40 days. So that was one change. There's countless others, but a huge change is that the royal family is prayed for in morning and evening prayer. And that will need to be changed. So every single 1662 Book of Common Prayer throughout the entire Church of England is going to need to be replaced. That's going to be expensive. Just saying. So, moving on to today's Gospel, Jesus tells us two parables about lost items. Now, I don't know about you, but on a good day, I lose things going from one room in my house to the other. This is a problem. And then, that's a good day. If I have a bad day, it goes like this. There I was. The other morning, I decided to wash my truck. As I start towards the garage, I spot the mail on the hall table. I should go through the mail before I wash the truck. I lay the car keys on the table, put the junk mail in the trash can under the table, after I pull all the addresses off, and I notice that the trash can is full. So I put the pills back on the table to take the trash out first. Since I'm going to be near the mailbox when I take the trash out anyway, I might as well pay the bills first. I see my checkbook on the table, but there's only one checkbook. My extra checks are in my desk in my study, so I go to the desk where I find a bottle of juice that I have been drinking. I'm going to look for my checks, but first I need to push the juice aside so I don't accidentally knock it over. But the juice is getting warm, and I should put it in the refrigerator to let it get cold. Headed towards the kitchen with the juice, a vase of flowers on the counter catches my eye. They need to be watered. I set the juice down on the counter, and I find my reading glasses, for which I had been searching for all morning. <laughs> I had better put them back on my desk, but first I'm going to water the flowers. I set my glasses back on the counter, fill a container with water, and suddenly I spot the TV remote. I now realize that I left it on the kitchen table. Tonight, when I sit down to watch TV, I'll be looking for the remote, but I won't remember that it's on the kitchen table. I should put it back in the TV room where it belongs. But first, I'm going to water the flowers. I splash some water on the flowers, but most of it still is on the floor. So I put the remote back down on the table, and I get some towels to wipe up the spill. Then I head down the hall, trying to remember 
remember what I was originally planning to do. The day has ended. I look back over my accomplishments, or lack thereof. The truck isn't washed. The bills aren't paid. There's a warm bottle of juice sitting on the counter. The flowers aren't watered. There's water all over the floor that I slipped on and hit my head. So I fell, and now I have a nasty headache. There's still only one check in my checkbook. I can't find the remote. I can't find my glasses, and I don't remember what I did with the truck keys. Now I'm trying to figure out why I got nothing done today. And it's quite baffling because I know I was busy all day long, and now I'm really tired. And through all of this, even before I decided to wash my truck, I started out looking for a letter that I lost and still cannot find. I can tell by the looks on many of your faces that this is all too familiar a scenario. No doubt, we have all experienced this type of fruitless and time-consuming day, especially when we're desperately searching for something that is lost that doesn't want to be found. Today, we hear the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. The lost son, better known as the prodigal son, comes next, but it's not included in today's gospel. So these two things that are lost, when they are found, tells us that in God's kingdom, every last person will be accounted for, and that we all matter. But before looking at today's gospel, a little recap. As the summer winds down, we have spent most of it hearing from Luke's journey narrative. I've said it before, but it deserves to be repeated. If you read the Gospel of Luke from chapter 9, verse 51, through chapter 19, verse 27, you can see a pattern. Jesus speaks to the large crowds, the Pharisees, and his own disciples. He speaks uniquely to each of these three audiences, doing so in a definable pattern between the crowds and the disciples, but the Pharisees are always sandwiched in between. To the crowds, Jesus preaches the coming kingdom of God. To the disciples, he speaks in a more instructive manner, teaching them about hospitality, suffering, possessions, honesty and dishonesty, and how to pray. He speaks even more differently to the Pharisees than he does the other two groups. His words carry a far more negative intent as he cryptically warns the religious charlatans through the clever use of parables that they will ultimately be rejected from the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is open to all. And therefore, even the Pharisees could find their way in. But they're going to have to change the path that they're on, which is the very definition of repentance. Today, Jesus addresses the Pharisees using two parables and the celebration over one sinner who repents to answer the criticism that Jesus receives sinners and even shares meals with them. Why did Jesus spend so much of his time with sinners? The religious leaders dismissed sinners as being irredeemable. They were only interested in those who could further their position within the society. But it was Jesus' mission to restore all to his flock. In the first parable today, Jesus aims his cleverly disguised words at the Pharisees themselves. When he says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 religious persons or righteous persons who do not need to repent. 
The 99 represents the Pharisees, who think that they have no need to change their ways. Such is the nature of self-righteousness. You don't see your own faults, yet those of others are readily apparent. In the parable of the lost coin, the coins refer to a piece of jewelry worn by brides that had ten silver coins attached to it. This was the equivalent of a modern-day wedding ring. For a bride to lose one of the pieces that were commonly sewn into a headpiece would be really, really bad. So, to have lost it, and then found it, unlike my letter, it would have brought great joy. So much so that upon its return, the woman literally throws a party. Jesus uses this parable to show the seriousness of God's desire to not lose even a single soul. Not one. We are told that the woman would never give up searching for the lost coin. Similarly, God will never give up in the search for every lost soul. Every person who is lost from the sheep fold of faith, for whatever reason, God will open up every possibility for that soul to return. If a person is searching for a relationship with God in Christ, no door will ever be closed in their path. Most of us have experienced this, so we can relate. However, we got to put some effort into it ourselves. My experience has shown that even though God opens doors for us, it's incumbent upon us to walk through them. As is often the case, today's gospel shows Jesus using the examples that the listener could relate to in order to show that God's economy, every last sinner that turns towards Christ, matters. And we are told that God, our Heavenly Father, rejoices every time a lost sinner returns to the Father. It would have been too easy to surround himself with the righteous, but Jesus still surrounds himself with sinners. Are we sinners? Of course we are. Even though we practice the Christian faith, we are far from perfect. As a follower of Jesus Christ, the key is to recognize this and kneel before our God and ask that we be forgiven. Such is the purpose of the general confession of sin that we say virtually every Sunday. Following our admission that we are indeed flawed and we are sorry for our misdoings, by the way, I feel these days that my sins are more the things left undone than the things done. But that's a subject for another day. Once we've come before God and asked for forgiveness for the errors in our ways, the priest then, acting strictly as a vehicle for God's <coughs> grace, nothing more, pronounces absolution upon the people. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins. And here's the really important part. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. It is only through the sacrificial death of Jesus of Nazareth that our sins are completely washed away and we're given a clean slate. But with the caveat that we at least make the attempt to not repeat them. We should heed Jesus when he says to the adulterous woman in John 8, 11, Go and sin no more. One has to wonder, would a shepherd really care 
about one sheep out of a hundred? Probably not. But God does. The message of today's lessons can be summed up nicely by the familiar statement from our reading from 1 Timothy today. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.